Hello and welcome to Black Leaders on Environmental Justice and Beyond, an event co-hosted by Green 2.0 in Hip Hop Caucus. I'm Ravia Ismail, Communications Manager at Green 2.0. Our organization works to diversify the environmental movement and ensure that environmental organizations and foundations are inclusive and equitable. We believe that every person should be at the decision-making table in our movement but that too often the voices of people of color are absent from conversations that impact them the most. During today's event, we will hear from black leaders doing the heavy lifting of environmental justice work and their perspectives on the future of the environmental movement as a whole. A few housekeeping notes before we start. First, we are live captioning today's event. Second, if you have questions throughout the event, please put them in the Q&A box. We will answer all questions to the best of our ability, but may not get to all of them. A very special thank you to our partners at Hip Hop Caucus. We appreciate you for collaborating with us in this important work and continuing to raise the bar for everyone in this movement. I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Representative Andre Carson. Rep Carson is in his seventh term in Congress, representing Indiana's seventh district. Rep Carson is an advocate for the middle class and has fought for good paying jobs, economic growth, and safer communities for working families. He is also an advocate for challenging systemic racism in public policy and legislation, and has championed the critical ways that hip hop has had an impact on American culture and policies. Thank you for joining us, Rep Carson. Thank you for the tremendous honor uh, of, of, of being here. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly honored to be here to help kick off this very important discussion uh, on environmental justice. Um, Got to give a shout out to uh, Green 2.0 and uh, my family with the Hip Hop Caucus for convening this wonderful roundtable. Uh, Got to give a shout out to uh, Ravia Ismail uh, to my brother from another mother, like no other, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, all day, every day, you know what it is. To Brother Eddie Love, thank you. To Latrice Snee, Karen Camplin, Karina Newsom, and all the participants today. You know, environmental justice, I think it really must be a key component of our efforts to really achieve full equality for people of color, period. Uh, our government has known that Black and brown folk are most affected by pollution since the 1980s uh, and before that when, but in 1980 in particular, when a, a landmark study was released proving the connection. And yet 35 years later, the crisis persists. Uh, black and brown people are dying prematurely every day and experiencing worse health outcomes because of basically where we live in communities across America, our neighborhoods are more likely to be polluted than white neighborhoods. And because of this, we're more likely to develop lifelong conditions like asthma. And we're less likely to get proper treatment for these illnesses because we lack the same access to health care. And this has made, this was even made more apparent throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, which disproportionately harm black and brown folks. And so these inequalities have compounded to create a public health crisis that has taken countless people away from us really before their time. You know, honoring these individuals is so important to our efforts to enact real change. We should always keep up this work in their honor. And, you know, environmental justice is also a larger part of the climate crisis. As climate change accelerates, our planet is nearing the point of no return, meaning we will not be able to stop or effectively reverse the worst effects of climate change. And you can be sure if this happens, people of color will be hit the hardest. Because of the, 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 the location of our neighborhoods and really the unequal distribution of power and economic resources, uh, we won't have the same ability really to escape or even mitigate the deadly effects of climate change. And, you know, even more of us will die because of that. Our situation is dire, but I want everyone to know that we're working hard in Congress to change things for the better. Uh, I know I'm fighting to pass bills 
that address this issue like the Environmental Justice for All Act introduced by my colleague, uh, Representative Grijalva, who is another champion for the environment. And this bill is so important because it puts more programs and resources in place to reverse the disproportionate impact of pollution on communities of color and, and help us seek accountability. In addition, uh, in this regard, I want to salute the Biden administration for its work on this matter. Uh, the administration has taken steps. We can always do more, and we always want to see more, but they've taken steps to place a greater focus on environmental justice, including you know, real benchmarks uh, to measure progress. And, and, and this is putting greater restrictions on businesses that pollute our neighborhoods. Uh, the EPA is also helping to alleviate HBC's role in fighting climate change throughout new programs and, and grants. And I think that this is real progress. Uh, it's clear we have a long way to go. Discussions like these are, are critically important in really strengthening our fight for our people and basically our planet. Um, we still have to look at raising cafe standards as vehicles are becoming smarter and they're getting greater fuel economy. There's still more that can be done legislatively to improve fuel economy as vehicles are getting smarter. We want to see smarter roads communicating with these smart vehicles to reduce the, the rate of fatalities that we're seeing out here. So I'll continue working side by side with you and know that I'm your brother and friend to the end. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so much, Congressman Carson. Our next speaker is the Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. Rev Yearwood is president and founder of Hip Hop Caucus, a minister, community activist, U.S. Air Force veteran, one of the most influential people in hip hop politics and a board member of Green 2.0. Rev Yearwood is a national leader within the Green Movement, successfully bridging the gap between communities of color and environmental advocacy. Thank you for being here, Rev Yearwood. Thank you for having me. I get to wear, I wear many hats. I get to wear my hat today from Hip Hop Caucus and my hat as a board member from Green 2.0. Uh, let me first start off by saying that I love my brother, Congressman Andre Carson. He's a dear friend, a dear ally. I just love him so much for what he has done. Um, I love his great state of Indiana, my good people out there in Indianapolis and Gary and Fort Wayne and all the good folks about that, that amazing state and what they're trying to do to transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. Let me leave with that in this conversation with actually Congressman Carson. I think one of the, the solutions is having not just us talk about the past, but the present. And by having him lead off this conversation is critical. Too many times in our movement, other conversations, we look to those in Congress who are not people of color. They're not black, brown, they're not indigenous. Um, they're, they're from, you know, they're, they're frankly white. And they are the ones we look to to lead this. But what we have seen through data and through our reporting, that those who score the highest in Congress throughout is those who are from the Asian Islander Pacific Caucus, those are from the Progressive Caucus, but definitely those who are from the Black and the Hispanic Caucus. They're the ones who are leading this fight and you don't see them on MSNBC, you don't see them on TV. So I want to leave with that. I think that is fundamentally what we are having this conversation about. The work that Green 2.0 is doing, who is holding accountable big green organizations, saying you're not doing enough to do to make sure that our communities are leading this effort. I want to be very clear. I believe the solution for the climate crisis is when you have a BIWOC leaderful movement a black, brown, indigenous, woman of color, leaderful movement leading. If that happens, we can transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. If that doesn't, we're gonna be stuck having dirty air and dirty water and in a position where we're having a climate crisis. But that's where we are today. And I think that's what this moment is. It's not about lifting up. I wanna salute Solutions uh, Project and have putting forth the Black Climate Week. But I want to say that, listen, Black folk been dealing with climate and pollution for a very long time. We just ain't come with a week now. And so I want to be very clear that we have been at the forefront of this issue, not only here in this country, but around the globe. And the one thing I want to say that's so important that I want to make sure there's so much to say, but I want to really hinge on what Congressman Carson also said about policy. 
the policy, either we shape policy or policy shapes us. We are dying, y'all. We are getting asthma. We are getting emphysema. We are getting cancer. My home in Louisiana has gone through Katrina and we just went through Ida. We are literally dying because of the hurricane, the wildfire, the droughts, the floods. We are dying when it hits and we are dying when it leaves. We're dying when it leaves because we are left behind. We're also dying when it leaves when people come in to steal our property and our land. And so that must be changed. We're dying because of the petrochemicals that are in Cancer Alley. I can go on and on. But this is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. And so we must break down the silos to know that climate justice is racial justice and racial justice is climate justice. So I just want to thank everybody for coming together. And I want to leave this. There are those who may think that because of black folk and brown folk and indigenous are coming together, they feel threatened. Don't feel threatened. This is how we will solve this crisis. When we all come together and we break the silos, so don't feel threatened, don't 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 feel uh, a gas. You hear about us about liberation for our people, but just know that this is the way because we have for so long not looked to this leadership. So again, I conclude how I started: the way we solve this climate kind of crisis by having a BIPOC leaderful movement, a Black, Brown, Indigenous woman of color leader full movement, leading and funded properly to make sure we can transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. God bless y'all. We pray for Ukraine and keep on fighting. All power to the people. Thank you, Reverend. You're really, that's, that was phenomenal. And, you know, again, to kind of harp on what you said, I think it's very important that we talk about collaboration and for us to not feel threatened in collaborating and to not necessarily not even compete with each other. So great points that you all made there. Thank you, Congressman Carson and Ravia for your remarks as well. I am Eddie Love, he, him, or my pronouns, a program manager with the Ocean Foundation based in Washington, D.C. And I will be your moderator today for today's event. And I'm looking forward to really having this conversation as we talk about Black leaders on the our own environmental justice, um, but also to harp off of what Reverend Drew has said, to acknowledge that we are facing a lot today in today's society, specifically today. And so prayers up for those in Ukraine. And we hope that today we can have also find some solutions to a lot of different topics. And so I would like to ask our phenomenal panelists to join us. And I want to thank each and every one of them for taking the time today. And I would also like to thank Green 2.0 and the Hip Hop Caucus for allowing me and inviting me to moderate such a panel full of esteemed and accomplished individuals. And so with that, I would like to give you all the opportunity to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind giving everyone, all of the attendees, your name, pronouns, your location, and where you currently work. That'd be great. And also what really encouraged or influenced you to get involved in the environmental movement. And we'll start with Karina first. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here. Thank you again to Green 2.0 for the um, for the invitation. And it's great to be able to learn and think and speak with such incredible minds. Uh, my name is Karina Newsom. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, the historic territory of the Muscogee Creek people. Um, and I currently serve as the community engagement manager at Georgia Audubon. And the thing that excited excites me and continues to excite me about being in this movement is, is that there's a whole history that Black people have um, in the environmental space that I was robbed of, I robbed of knowing um, in my education. And I'm just learning about some of these things as an adult and it's exciting and it's beautiful and it's encouraging. And so that's one thing that very much excites me about being in this movement right now. Thank you, Karina. You're also being very humble. You also co-organized the Black Murders Week. And so we wanna give a shout out to that in response to racism um, of Christian Cooper in Central Park. So thank you for your work. We'll shoot it over next to Latrice. Hello, everyone. My name is Latrice Snee. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm located in outside of the DC metro area in a Manahope land. Uh, I work at Bonsai Leadership Group where I cultivate nonprofit leaders to create inclusive um, cultures, primarily in the environmental space. Um, you know, I, I, my profession in the environmental space has been by accident, but just growing up and having family members, Reverend Yearwood, when he was speaking, talking about how um, the environment is actually killing us. I've had uh, family members who have lost their lives to environmental um, efforts that have um, harmed our communities. Um, but I've also experienced where 
um, environmental efforts have kind of destroyed the economic value of Black communities also. So it's just kind of a full circle moment being in this space now professionally, and I'm committed to doing what I can to change the movement for the better. Thank you, Latrice. As we all know, it starts at the top, and so the work you do is extremely critical. So we'll touch a little bit more on that further down the conversation, and we'll shoot over to last but not least, Karen. Hi, Eddie. It's great to be here. And first of all, I'd like to thank Green, Green 2.0 and the Hip Hop Caucus for having such a very well-rounded and uh, impressive panel here today, women led, yay. So I just, I'm just very happy to be here. Again, my name is Karen Camblin. I am um, in Fairfax, Virginia, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a, by trade, I'm a community development planner and I focus on transportation projects, transportation improvement and community development. For the purpose of this program, I'm representing my advocacy side, which is I'm currently the president of the Fairfax County NAACP branch. And I also serve as the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee Chair for the Virginia State Conference and WACP. And the reason why I got involved in this is really kind of like what Latrice and Karina said prior before me is just starting to see things in my personal life, in my professional life, and wanting to be able to get involved in a community activism world and try and educate and bring other people into the fold because like a Reverend Weir Yearwood and Congressman Carson had said prior, we need a big table, we need everybody together and we need to get everybody to understand that environmental rights is something that everybody should be a part of. It's a conversation that in should include everybody. Environmental justice is a civil rights issue, it's an economic justice issue and everybody should be at the table. So. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Great, thank you, Karen. And you know, you do a lot of work on the policy front too. And so we'll touch a little bit on that as well. And so we'll kick it off here with you all with a few questions, but I just wanna remind our attendees, we have 354 people in attendance right now. So a lot of people looking for takeaways from you all from your expertise and knowledge and experiences. And if you all have questions, please feel free again to drop that in the chat. And we'll try to answer as many as we can towards the end of the session. But being that this conversation is centered around, centered around Black leaders on environmental justice and beyond, I do want to ask each of you, what does it personally mean to you to be a Black environmentalist? And we'll start off with you, Karina, again. Um, thanks, Eddie. So I think to me to be a Black environmentalist, and this is becoming more true every day, I believe, every year, um, is to be able to bring the fullness of myself to my work in wildlife conservation. My profession is as a wildlife biologist. Um, that's what my training is in. Um, and so being able to bring the entirety of my identity, um, my perspective, my story, my body, <laughs> my hair, my culture, every part of myself that I felt was a was a um, essentially a detriment based on who I was seeing as the experts in this field, I realized was very much an asset and beautiful. Um, and so being able to bring that fullness and encourage other people to bring that fullness um, who are in the black community who are aspiring or working in this field to do the same. Yes, thank you. Being your authentic self, right? And being able to come into these spaces and really perform at that level. Latrice, what about you? Yeah, like um, Karina, I mean, that, that authentic voice is really important. So, you know, for me, it's using my voice and my power to create equity in the environmental space, but also to um, use that power to dismantle the systems and norms that have been created um, that use the environment to harm Black people in our communities. Um, it's really important that we stand up and say those things that need to be said, even when it's difficult to do so in order to affect change. Also, it means, you know, partnering and collaborating and fighting for the change we wish to see. So, um, you know, I think we have a lot of roles when we're playing in this black environmentalist space um, and it's exhausting, it can be exhausting sometimes, but we can't, we cannot give up. Yes, I don't know how many times I tell people it's a very discouraging field, environmental and DIJ related issues, right? But you have to continue to push forward. Uh, Karen, let's close out with you and we'll jump into some of the deeper questions here. Yeah, definitely. Um, everything ditto to everything that was set up to this point. Uh, and then I would just add is, you know, as we're trying to bring more people into the folds, it's it's kind of like a, a tunnel that just doesn't end because 
you know, the Black community, we're not a monolith, right? So we're talking about users, we're talking about education, we're talking about Black farmers, and it's just understanding just having, you know, being a Black environmentalist, particularly now, is also having to understand all these different other elements of trying to get equity and to remove those disparities and having that education and bringing it to the table and then finding somebody and say, well, did you think of Black farmers? Well, hey, I got somebody who needs to be at this table. Let me make that connection. So it's also bringing up, um, um, uh, serving as a bridge to make sure every, all the different facets and elements are at that table. Great, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you all. I think we can jump into some of the deeper questions here. People have a, a good sense of you and what you stand for. And, you know, kind of piggybacking off of what Reverend Yearwood said at the beginning about, you know, really data collection, right? And I want to thank Green 2.0 again for really leading this charge and to talk a little bit about metrics in our space. And so, of course, in 2021, November to be exact, Green 2.0 released the report, report card for transparency and found that there was a disproportionate amount of money going to white-led organizations, right? And that many of those foundations have not even begun to collect that on demographics of their grantees in addition to their staff, right? And so what are some ways that you all think that foundations can truly start to invest in Black-led organizations? And then Karen, I'll actually shoot this back to you because you touched on investment a little bit there. Um, yes, definitely. I think part of it is, like you said, just making sure that there are people at the table, right? But there's just making sure that the Black community has access to what that clean energy, tra the transition into clean energy can be. So making sure, for instance, um, solar panel energy, making sure that um, Black entrepreneurs have the opportunity to get their information out there, right? So we're, we're working on a project now with a lot of different organizations to create that Black owner database and try to get that into the mainstream uh, conversation. And then making sure, you know, talking to white-led larger corporations that are used to getting access to the funding, they know how the institution works. So it's also trying to figure out a way to kind of simplify some of those processes to allow Black and BIPOC um, um, organizations and employees and students and everybody to be able to participate in it. And how do we break those um, pieces down so everybody can have access to it. It's not too large for the smaller um, 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 folks and companies and everybody to be able to participate. Right, right. And, and really a lot of that is what I heard from you is, you know, really providing those resources right at every level. Um, and also, you know, really building the capacity to set everyone up for success. And Latrice, I see you're unmuted and ready to go. Yeah, because this is, this is a topic that uh, I kind of get a little passionate about because um, <laughs> Well, foundations and philanthropic groups, they're always talking about how they want to support DEI, how they want to support different um, types of efforts related to racial equity, but um, they're not willing to change themselves, you know, and so some of the things that I think they can do, number one is forgetting about their internal processes. So it's always an excuse for why they can't do something or they can't give something because of their internal process. Forget about your internal process and change it. Um, change the way that you've always done grant making to adjust to the, to if you really want to make a difference. And it's also about being proactive versus reactive. So just stop just sending out RFPs and asking organizations to apply. Go to those black led organizations and ask them questions. Ask them what they need. Ask them how you can help them be successful. Ask them about what challenges they're facing. Ask them how you, the grant maker, can make it easier for them to apply and gain funds. Or, or not even apply, just give them what they need. You know, Develop that type of relationship with some black led organizations where they can call you up to get advice, support, and funding when needed. That's what they have to do. They have to change the way, their traditional ways of implementing grant making in order to develop these relationships with Black-led organizations. If you say that's what you want to do, do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Karina. So one thing, so I, I'm right there with Latrice because this is an issue that I feel like as a young professional, I've been coming up uh, upon a lot and that I've also talked with Latrice about specifically actually and wanting to piggyback on her, you know, like looking at the, the system itself, there's an entire system, an entire culture that is developed in philanthropy that has excluded black and brown people this whole time. And so in addition to just like the, 
the bureaucracy of philanthropy, the cult, there's a whole culture that you have to know how to navigate in order to kind of win in the game, uh, which is toxic and continues to be exclusionary. And so that has to be addressed in its like at the, at the fine tuned, very like granular levels of the system. And even things like, are the funds restricted or not, right? Oftentimes when you're living in the margins of society, you have to have the flexibility to respond to your community. And these things can change on a dime, right? If you're dealing with like highly restricted funds, you don't have that freedom. Um, or if you're talking about like the, the, the timeline of dispersing the funds, right? Like the, these things are all, all have to be thought about. Um, and the and nonprofit AF and an organization called Rooted in Vibrant Communities in Seattle has a phenomenal kind of like rubric to figure out if you're doing granting and a philanthropy equitably. And I'm gonna put a link to that in the chat um, right now. So be on the lookout for that. No, thank you. And I'm going to go off script here a little bit. I knew this would happen, but, you know, you know, you touched on something very important there too, both you and Latrice and Karina, um, really about funding, right, for a lot of these groups and timeline is something that you mentioned. And I'm interested to know from each of you, what does that look like? And when you think about different organizations who feel as though they give 2,500 or 5,000 from a year, that they've done their due diligence to, right, address diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice at these organizations, what does that look like or what ways that groups can improve with funding those smaller groups or grassroots organizations? Yeah, I can actually give you an example of a, a, of a group that I'm working with right now um, that approached me about helping. It's a new um, Black-led nonprofit organization. Um, so they, they don't have a board. They're trying to figure out what to do and what steps to take and they need guidance. So they came to me and said, you know, we want to work with you. Here's the thing, they've got a foundation that is supporting them in their organizational development, um, the leadership development that has said, you figure out what you need and let us know and we'll pay for it. So we talk about what she needed, we laid it out, she went back to the foundation, they said, this looks great, boom, wrote a check and gave it to her because it was a need that they knew that she had to have in order to be successful. That's how you help Black-led organizations. You listen to the Black leaders. You listen to the Black leaders that understand what they need, and then you believe in them, and you trust them, and you put the resources behind them in order to make sure that they're successful. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Correct. Karen or Karina, anything to add to that? Um, the one thing that I guess I would add as far as timeline is concerned is, you know, things as, you know, as, as, as basic as how long can, you know, how quickly do these funds have to be spent? Like, what is the timeline of the grant, right? And like, re like st instead of having these strict timelines, like this must be used within a year, like being able to use those funds on the timescale that is most appropriate for that community. Again, structuring the way that you're interacting um, and, and, and the expectations that you create based on the needs of the community versus being based on the culture that has, again, been developed over decades, hundreds of years sometimes um, in philanthropy. Right, oh, thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, the, the thing, what I would add is um, also, um, having those internal measures, it's one thing to say, we want to have more diversity in how we allocate our funds, but are you really doing it? And have set goals that are measurable, that are quantifiable, and having somebody who is accountable and responsible for doing that tracking. So it's anchored to someone, to some policy that's internal to that particular organization. And then, in, you know, I would say upfront, you know, having uh, more frequent check-ins, like every, you know, every quarter or every, you know, midterm or whatever, instead of, we don't, we definitely don't want the evaluation to happen five years, right? We want it to be, particularly since this is, they're just redoing and starting this new program to just keep track of how that funding mm -hmm. is going and measure internally and mm -hmm. hold leadership responsible. And if it's a large corporation that has an influence, making them hold the people they work with accountable and responsible because they too can influence other companies depending on their influence, their affluence, and just how, how much people are within their network. 
No, great point. And I think that now, you know, especially following June 2020, that, you know, there's been a heightened level of accountability for a lot of groups, right? And social media in itself has played a huge role in, in that and allowing us to see these disparities. And so, you know, something that we can kind of, you know, really rely on a little bit with a grain of salt. Social media is also a little problematic, right? Um, but Latrice, go ahead. I see you've unmuted. You've you got a little passion and fire burning, right? Well, I thought about one more thing that just burns me up about uh, the ph philanthropic space um, in terms of black led leadership is, you know, when when organizations want to support um, diverse led organizations, I want to I want them to hear this. Stop going to white led organizations to ask them to partner with BIPOC organizations. So you can funnel your money through the white led organization and the white led organization just dribbles out mm -hmm. a few dollars to the partner group that has to then do whatever that white led organization wants to do. Create your own relationship with that BIPOC organization, with that black led organization. Stop going through these big white led green organizations in order to get your diversity fix. Mm -hmm. And you, you really just set the chat on fire there. So a lot of truths and a lot of 100% is in there. So thank you for that. A great takeaway for everyone. And as we kind of talk about this, we've been speaking more externally, right, about grant making and what foundations can do. And Karen, you touched on this a little bit just about, you know, internal measures that we can really take as groups, right? And so there is a big difference in discussing, you know, the external need for racial justice, but also, you know, with them not recognizing that internally as that the workplace culture needs to change, right? And so what factors have specifically or, you know, for you personally caused you to stay or leave organizations that you've been at? And we'll go to Karen first. Um, okay, so, you know, you're very general basic, your incentives, your medical and all those things, but um, personally is, do I have the support and backing of the corporation? What is leadership doing? Is leadership allowing hostility to exist within the workforce? And if there is hostility, what are, how immediate is the reaction? And are they trying to, I guess, victim blame, or are they really trying to find the root cause? Um, and then, you know, are they taking it a step further? Is it going to, is it, is it all case by case basis? Or does this, is this going to result in policy change? And is that policy change going to be effective? So, it, you know, yeah, those great packages are fantastic, wonderful, but it's also how am I treated? Is my worth, is my value, is my contribution to the company um, accepted and appreciated and acknowledged that it helps the company's mission advance as well? Can I take you back off of something? So one thing that you mentioned, uh, Karen, about, you know, do you have the backing of your organization? Um, something that has come up repeatedly over the course, again, of my short tenure in this field so far um, has been, number one, a lot of Black professionals in environmental spaces, especially right now, are tasked with, like, carrying the work of equity and diversity on their back for an entire organization um, and are therefore exposed to, like, a disproportionate amount of hostility around that work. And when an organization is not willing to compromise their proximity to power to protect their employee, that employee will guaranteed at some point be harmed by that organization. And I've seen it happen over and over again where, you know, they say they want to make these claims to equity and diversity. They hire somebody or they hire some people to do the work. They get blowback from funders. They get blowback from partners, people who are pretty committed to maintaining the status quo or even individuals who have power and connections. And they completely backpedal or they, they kind of abandon that employee or those, you know, those employees in order to maintain, again, their proximity to power access to resources and, and, and uh, relationship with these powerful organizations. Um, and so unless you're willing to make those sacrifices, right, you might want to rethink the public, the public statements and the public commitments, right, because it will 100% co you know, come with blowback. It will 100% come with you having to rethink partnerships and rethink who is funding your work. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of share that as one of the reasons why I've had to reconsider where I work, leaving or staying in an organization and have to, will likely have to navigate that going forward. Um, as a professional. Well, piggybacking off of um, some of the things that Karina mentioned, you know, the thing I heard a lot of was, well, the board, the board has some concerns or this donor, I'm not sure about this donor. You know, if you're going to get in this space, it's not going to be easy. 
you know, and that's probably why it hasn't changed. One of the reasons why it hasn't changed because it is going to be difficult and it, it requires you to change your norms, to change the things that you value. And it might mean saying no to that donor. It might mean saying no to that, to that board member and not pleasing other people as um, Karina mentioned. So you have to stand in your power too if this is something that you, that you really wanna do. But there's so many organizations out there that are, you know, um, doing these performative type actions, claiming to support DEI, but not providing the resources to support it. Red flag, you know, they they hire a DEI officer and make them report to, you know, the human resources person. Red flag, you know, they they not really willing to change any of the things, the systems, they like to be comfortable. And that, un that thought of being uncomfortable and changed feels, feels, you know, uncomfortable to them to want to, you know, lean into. So then you have, you know, things that um, arise, the tokenism, you know, the using of the black face to, you know, highlight, hey, we got some diversity now, you know, um, or the gaslighting that comes along with, you know, Black leaders and, and staff members that come into the space and when those situations like Karina has shared happen, the gaslighting begins, you know. There's also, you know, the day-to-day -day microaggressions. Now, let me let me back up a little bit. I've been in all these situations and I've stayed in, in some situations way too long. I've gotten older now. You know, it's not all about, you know, that good check. My, my grandmama used to say, well, you making some good money. Well, good money ain't always uh, good money is not always good in that sense. Your health, your your um, your values. There's so many more things that are important. And when it comes to that tokenism, gaslighting, microaggressions, the lack of respect, you know, that's when I have to say, yeah, I'm don't I'm out. I'm out. You know, if organizations want to continue to keep Black people in diverse organizations, they not only need to do a good job of recruiting folks, a diverse um, group of people, they need to be better at making their places of employment more inclusive. And that doesn't mean making sure people assimilate to your culture. That means you change your culture to really support all the dimensions of diversity that that person is bringing to your organization. Yes, a couple of finger snaps from Karina there. And, you know, one other thing as you were talking about tokenism and, you know, gaslighting that came to my mind was also nepotism, which is really huge across our sector, right? And a lot of these organizations really feel that bringing individuals through internships, diversity-focused internships is more than enough to really change or curb that dynamic, right? When in actuality, it's not because they're not doing that same level of work at the board, right? And so it's really about changing the system all around and engaging and really instilling those values, not only just through trainings, right, but also in each and every individual that works at your organization to really educate them on what it takes to create that inclusive environment. Um, and and kind of just to switch gears here, we've talked a lot about funding and just, you know, the passion that we have with changing internal culture, but let's jump a little bit more into policy, right? And so, Karina, this is a question that, you know, we chatted about a little bit, so very, very excited to get your take on it. But Black communities, you know, have historically been purposely excluded from America's public lands. What progress have we seen here? Um, what more needs to be done to ensure that we ourselves and our history on public lands, um, that we see ourselves on, in history on public lands, and to do such in a way that also promotes justice for Indigenous peoples and does not perpetuate their erasure? Uh, that's a great question. And one thing that I continue to learn and, and, and know to be true is that, um, you, know, we, you, you know, we hear and use phrases like black liberation. And one thing that we have to be careful of, um, and I think almost like the systems that are already at play try to almost coordinate is that black liberation doesn't mean black people getting to yield the same power over people and land and resources that colonizers have, right? It's, it's not trying to be part of that structure. It's, it's eliminating the structures that allow individuals and, and you know, an elite few to wield this kind of power and cause harm. Um, and so liberation 
everything from you know the actual resources themselves to like the truth being told and history being told um, truthfully is that there has to essentially be an understanding that our our justice for us is inextricably tied to justice for indigenous peoples on this land. Um, indigenous people, including black indigenous people who are on this land and knowing that we can't, we can't see this justice come to reality in a silo, right? Um, so being able to, the, the, the thing that's been encouraging as far as progress in this space has been the coalition building, particularly, especially among black, you know, descendants of enslaved Africans on this continent and indigenous people on this continent, uh, where we're realizing that, you know, of people of color, like these groups have a very specific and unique history on this land and in this country and putting our resources and our and our efforts and our fights together um, because we need we need to be able to, to incorporate and center one another in our efforts because it is possible. We see this happen frequently where, you know, certain solutions to environmental issues end up hurting somebody else or end up hurting already marginalized communities. And that's not a pattern of harm that we want to or should uh, perpetuate or continue. Um, and so in order to do that, continuing to and expanding our, our joint efforts with Indigenous people around storytelling, truth-telling, um, and justice around land and environmental issues. And so um, seeing these kinds of coalitions continue to bubble up through, and again, it's, I, I see it often led by a lot of young people uh, who are seeing the, 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 the need and the necessary, um, the, the necessity for intersectional efforts um, that incorporate all parts of our identities, but especially being intentional around um, the issues that indigenous people are facing on this continent. So um, coalition building, I think is so is so important. Great, thank you. Always a great point of intersectionality, right? And um, I'll, you know, I'll give Karen a chance to respond to that as well if she would like. Yes, definitely, thank you. And I think part of it in terms of making um, public land such a, um, hostile space to be in is not just whether or not bodies are going to be accepted and or how others are going to react to them, but how are these spaces designed and presented to the public? And so, for instance, um, 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 Interior Secretary um, Deb Hal Halen had a derogatory geographic task force that actually looked at the names and some of the words that were used and identified derogatory names that were being used. Um, I don't want to say them, but there were some that were derogatory to the indigenous communities that they are now in the process of removing those names from public spaces, from public parklands, and from the way communication within the agency happens. And so words matter, representation matters, and acceptance matters. And you know what helps in terms of within the black community to remove all of those Confederate and those artifacts and, and the false and inaccurate representation of history, it has turned into such a hostile environment that is uninviting to the black community and those who are aware of those inaccuracy. We have also had those things that I never really knew until I heard about this task force. And then it dawned on me and said, yes, even within the indigenous community, there are things that we don't realize culturally that is not acceptable. And so understanding that, and it's not assimilation, but it's the acceptance of difference of cultures and understanding of what each culture would like to have and what is offensive and making sure our public spaces are able that it, making sure our public spaces do not present these offensive um, names or you know artifacts or what have you to make sure that everybody, we want our children to be able to go to public spaces and have representation that they're gonna be proud of and say, I can be that in the future, not I am, you know, you know, there's something wrong with me because this is what society is putting forward. So that so that that's you know something that I would add to the conversation. No, great. And you know, as you as you talk about that, me just simply being from Alabama, right? And just just constantly driving around seeing all of the different statues and the Confederate flag making me feel really uncomfortable, unwelcome in a region that I call home, right? It's it's very critical. And so as we start to really dismantle that more and more, I, I do hope for that change, but we know that it's a long road ahead of us, right? And I also want to highlight, you know, what Joyce Woodson said in a, in a chat in response to what Karina and Karen said, is that we have to stop comparing 
sharing trauma and focusing our energies on collaboration and coalitions. And again, I think that is so very important. It's, it's not a competition. It really is a joint effort to all of us really fighting for change and fighting for respect across this industry and just in life in general, right? And so we have a few more minutes left and there's one more question that I really want to ask you all um, before we wrap up here and give the audience a chance. But recently, the House Committee on Natural Resources hosted a hearing on diversity and environmental movement and really discussed the need for racial equity in the sector, right? Especially when it comes to policy making. What are examples of, a way, of the way that environmental policy making has been harmful to Black communities? because of the lack of diversity in the movement? And what are some examples of policies that succeeded because of collaboration? Karen, I'll actually start with you again, being that this, you know, your realm right now too. So I, I, I didn't really get the full, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is, what are some examples of ways that environmental policy has been harmful to Black communities um, because of the lack of diversity in the movement and some examples that have succeeded? Yeah, uh, you know, I would, you know, the first thing that I would start off is just site suitability, you know, and the policies that make it difficult for communities to be involved in, in, in having the way that our, our, our zoning and our land use laws are put in place. Um, to make it difficult for the black and brown communities to be have an active and intentional and transformative role in deciding where things are placed. And the barriers that are in all of our, our systems that make it easier for um, the, 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 the companies to say, to devalue the intrinsic values of black historic and archeological resources, devalue our property in order to be able to make it easier for them to place, you know, whether it's a toxic facility or whatever. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, the black and brown community is still struggling to try and get the name out. And, and this is really why the environmental justice movement really started taking foothold in the seventies with the trying to put the landfill in Warren County and then realizing, uh, you know, through the analysis that Dr. Bullard had done, you know, looking at what was happening in North Carolina, look what was happening on the Southeast, look at what's happening in the nation. All of these sites were being placed according to regulation, but they were all in the African-American communities or black and brown communities or communities in the well. So, you know, trying to get those policies that change that encourages and, and, and enforces more participation from the community. And as what was said by Corinne and Latrice, hearing from the actual community, this is what we want. And this is where it would be acceptable. And this is how it should be designed. Getting those important um, 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 uh, messages. It's so many times we hear from the black community that our history is actually um, oral, right? So yes, I know there is a, a, a cemetery over there but we can't even get that to be part of the public record, to be part of the decision-making process when they're doing sites. So we know there's a cemetery there but they're just ignoring it. And, and I'll just stop there. <laughs> Latrice, Karina, Karina, go ahead. So one thing I wanted to, to add was thinking about policy, like even on the kind of hyper local level, when you have like policies that are true to like a city, for example, um, research by a, a black scholar from Atlanta, um, Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelk, she focuses a lot on the um, kind of social systems that, that you know, end up see, you know, re realizing green gentrification is one thing that she focuses a lot on. And this kind of falls more on the side of when we're problem solving around issues of environmental inequity, how we do it can end up hurting the same people where, you know, you invest in green space health, you invest in access to green space, but in the process, you have not protected the legacy predominantly black um, or low wealth communities in these areas. And then property values skyrocket, you know, uh, property taxes skyrocket and they can't afford to even live there and reap the benefits of this investment that's happened. And this, you know, one of the things that she identified was that this happens because of like, there's no requirement that these siloed entities are working together. Like housing is not working with the folks who are working with parks or working with the folks who are working, you know what I mean? In economic development in an area. And so when you have these dis disconnected efforts we see harm even in our solutions. And so I would definitely encourage folks to, to look her up, but um, both in, you know, when it comes to pollution, as well as when it comes to problem solving, these lack of policy or racist policies can end up harming black communities. 
Definitely, totally agree with that. And, you know, again, that, st that strategic planning process is very important, right, for those voices to be heard. Oftentimes, groups create programs and, and infiltrate, if I may say for a lack of better words, those communities and groups and, you know, think that that is enough to give them the resources when in reality, they need to be a part of those conversations, right? And so, Latrice, anything that you want to add to that before we move on? I ain't, I ain't touching that. They were both <laughs> answers were awesome and right on point. I just say ditto and ditto to um, Karen and Karina's comments. Perfect. All right. Well, that ends. I have one question at the very end for you all that'll set us up for closing. Um, but we'll jump into some questions from the audi audience here. And so one question for you all is, as a young Black woman at the beginning of my career, I have less flexibility. How do I balance putting myself first, but also wanting and needing experience slash job continuity to advance professionally? I'll give that to anyone who wants to answer it. I, I, I would add, um, you know, when you are young and just entering your career, it can feel daunting to kind of share your boundaries, your needs, your desires out of that or any expectations out of that employer but I encourage you to develop a the type of relationship with your supervising leader to share some of the things that you need. If you need time and space throughout your day, share that with your supervisor. Ask them how they can make sure that you get what you need to thrive and to be most successful. So no one really knows what you need unless you share it. So I encourage you to have those conversations and explore ways that you can get your needs met in order to be your best self. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Latrice. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump into the second question here that we have. I hope that's very helpful for the young lady that asked that question. Um, and the second question reads, it's hard sometimes to know what a job or organization is really like until you work there, which I know we've all experienced that before. Do you have anything you look for or tips for job seekers who want to make sure, okay, let's say, want to make sure the organization they join is truly committed to racial equity for employees and supporting environmental justice. Um, Go ahead. Yep. One, one thing that I'll say is, you know, obviously, depending on what your organization does, it can look different. But for me, one thing that I look at is what is this organization's relationship with the, the communities where it is, um, the black and brown communities where it's located, and get feedback from the community. Sometimes it's easier to do that than others. Like if you're not from a place and you have no connections, it can be hard to maybe get that feedback. But I would, in any way that you can, kind of understand how the community around it perceives that, you know, their work and how they've interacted with people um, to help kind of inform their commitment like is this just talk or are they actually following this out and do the people they're working with actually feel that they are doing what they say they're doing as far as their commitments are concerned so that's what i would would recommend yeah building off us uh karina you know talking to and finding out if there are connections that you know or people who may know someone that knows someone at those organizations and having those conversations with people to ask them about what their experience has been like or even people who used to work at the organization, if you come across them, you know, asking them about their experience, why they left, what they would, what they would consider or think about when they're joining the organization. Also during the interview process, you know, ask those, ask those that are interviewing you, you know, what are the biggest challenges that you face when it's come, come, come to diversity, equity, inclusion? See if they're going to be honest and say, yeah, you know, we struggle with these things. Or if they're going to say, oh, we're totally committed, we're woke, you know, if they say that red flag out the door, you know, but you, what you're looking for is for that organization to be honest about the challenges that they're facing for them to say, you know what? We really struggle with these issues, but these are the things that we're doing to address it. And so that's the key point. What are they doing to address those challenges? If they don't have any solutions or they tell you, oh, we've got a committee, internal committee, that's another red flag. You know, what are you doing besides having these committees or listening sessions? Um, so there are some things that you can do, but really be um, thoughtful and asking a lot of questions. Yes, that's that's key to ask it. A thing that I do quite often and to really ask people to be transparent with you, right, about their experiences. So that way you're informed to really make your decision on your own, to know what you're walking into and more prepared. Uh, so thank you both for that. 
And we have a third question here. I think we can squeeze two more in. Um, this question is, what should business leaders know as they are making corporate sustainability plans that address environmental justice issues? And are their businesses already doing this well? So this looks like a, a tough question. I'll give you all a second to think there. Karen, anything from you on this one? I'm still thinking about the part about businesses that do this well, but I did think of something else that I think might be loosely related to this. And that is um, attributing and acknowledging using the work created by a Black-led movement, um, because there are times when Black-led groups and organizations, you know, and ex experience going on the internet, going, wait a second, I know where this is from. And it's not attributed to where they, it, its original um, source. And that is also part of how you can, you know, um, increase um, competitiveness for funding as well, right? So it's not only acknowledging, but it's also hindering or kind of muting the voice of that Black-led organization. So I would say that would be one of the, the, the things in which uh, businesses being quite open with who they're partnering with, particularly if it's a minority um, or a black or women owned uh, partnership that they mm -hmm. are involved with. Perfect, thank you. Go ahead, uh, Latrice. Yeah, I was gonna say in terms <clears throat> of um, the business community, I think that um, some of the same suggestions apply just like the foundation community is, you know, working with black led organizations going to them, asking them for their advice, asking them for their feedback, asking them about what they need, it still applies to the business community as well. Um, oftentimes the business community is um, concerned, I would say, I won't say all of them, but many times are more concerned about the story they can tell as a, as a result of this um, relationship. Um, so I would say, you know, step back and, and ask that partner, how can the work that they would do together really transform or enhance or have tremendous impact on their mission? You know, and that becomes more of the, the number one goal versus how that company is seen in their action. Um, in terms of companies that are doing it right, I hesitate to give anybody the kudos until I really know like everything. But um, I will say that I have I have um, been watching REI and some of the funds that they have created, and now the, and they've engaged a lot of people of color in developing some of their ways that they're going to go about grant making in the future. So I'll give them kudos for that that specific piece. <laughs> Yes, research, research, research before we do kudos, right? And so, you know, with all of that, I think we have time for one last audience question here. And this one is to each and every one of you. Um, a more general question is, what changes would you all like to see across which systems and across which systems uh, that would change the current norms so that BIPIC leaders work is central to climate conversations to create solutions? We'll start off with you first, Karina. I was about to ask you if you could restate the question. I was like typing in the in the chat. And can you say this the question one more time? Oh, you're on you're on mute. I am on mute. <laughs> yes. So, what changes would you all like to see, and across which systems that would change the current norms so that BIPIC leaders' work is central to climate conversations to create solutions? Yeah. So. Sometimes I struggle to imagine what it would look like to, to see this actually play out. Um, but the, what, the change that I would like to see is that the people who are making, making the choices, who have the power to make decisions are people who's, who themselves or their loved ones have been subjected to these most horrible harms of the environment, you know, that the uh, environmental injustice has posed on communities. Seeing people who are making decisions about the educational, the education that, that, that young people living in poverty are receiving is, you know, is disastrous. When, when you have people who have no idea what it's like to live subjected to these harms, it's disastrous. And so seeing the people who are actually um, formed by those experiences, making those, those decisions is what I would love to see in these, um, in these decision-making positions and, and, and power. Um, and seeing people actually being willing to, and I, you know, we say this a lot and I hear this a lot and I say it a lot, 
you know, give up power. And I think that's almost losing its, you know, its substance because of how much people say it, but literally people have to be willing to not have the power. Like, and it's, it, it's no, it, I can't make it any more plain than, than that. And as long as people's first priority is to maintain that and to maintain decision-making power, resource power, resource access, like all these panels and all these, again, focus groups and listening sessions that a lot of these larger white-led organizations are leading are absolutely performative and, and do nothing and are tiring and taxing to people like us, right? Who keep, you know, who have done, been part of these efforts. And so um, that that's really all that I have to say, I think, <laughs> on that question. Perfect, and, and you got the kudos from the other two, so they completely agree with everything that you said. And, you know, unfortunately, we are wrapping up here. We approach two o'clock right now. And so I want to thank each and every one of you um, for participating in this panel to Green 2.0, the Hip Hop Caucus as well. Before we leave, would each of you mind letting people know where they can find you in the event that they want to learn more about the work that you do you're doing? Karen, you first. Um, I think the best way to get in contact with me via email would be at um, ktc1426 at gmail.com. Um, I'm in Fairfax, Virginia. So if you're in Virginia, just let me know. Perfect. And Twitter, if you have Twitter, where, where can they find Oh, you? Twitter is, oh, this, I do. Uh, let's see, at ktc, <laughs> at ktcampblion. And um, yes, and then I also, you know, joined the Facebook for Fairfax County NAACP. We've got um, a Facebook page for the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee, and we've got a Facebook for Renew Deal Virginia Coalition. So, so many different hats that you can reach out and get a hold of me. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. Latrice. Karen, you're right around the corner. We're going to have to get together. <laughs> but um, I can be reached on Twitter, Latrice Sneed, um, or even on um, LinkedIn. Same thing, Latrice Sneed. That's the easiest way. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Latrice. And last but not least, Karina. Um, so my email is Karina Newsom at gmail.com. Uh, and on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at hood naturalist, hood underscore naturalist on Twitter, hood underscore underscore naturalist on Instagram. Um, and before I go, I just want to say, Eddie, thank you so much for, for moderating this panel so um, beautifully and, and smoothly. And there's always so much to talk about. So just thank you so much for the phenomenal job, job you did this afternoon. Thank you. It's been a thank pleasure you. to speak with you. <laughs> Thank you all. I'll pastor Atlanta on my way to Alabama, so we'll have to link up at some point. Um, but again, thank you all for your time today. Thank you, everyone, Reverend Yearwood, Congressman Carson, Rabia, and Adrian, Alicia, for setting this up. We will send out an email with everyone's social media handles, and we will respond as best as we can to any outstanding questions. So once again, thank you for joining the conversations on Black leaders in the environment and beyond as we discuss 